Welcome to our Teen Science Cafe event. My name is Callum. I'm the Youth and Family Volunteer Coordinator here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. I just wanted to say a special welcome to everyone who's watching online. So this is going to be broadcasted as well. So a lot of people here and away are also watching this as well. So if you feel like you have a family member who's missing out on with some really cool conversations that's going to happen today, you can check it out online as well. Okay, so I just wanted to welcome you all here again and welcome to our live uh, broadcast here as well. So we're gonna get started with our Teen Science Cafe event and our presentation. I expect some more people to trickle on in and that's totally fine as well. I also wanted to say for everyone here and for our live stream, if you're going to continue joining us for this series, please do. Um, we're gonna be starting at six o'clock um, from this Teen Science Cafe onwards, okay? So six o'clock is when we're gonna be starting. I know it says something a little bit different on the tickets, but that's totally fine. Um, they have been updated in our system as well. So six o'clock to 7.30. Um, and another quick announcement, some of you might, it's a little bit dark outside. We don't want you to wait out there in the cold if your parents are maybe driving to pick you up a couple minutes late, that's totally fine. Please let me know, stay with us, and we will take care of you until then. So don't feel the need to wait outside in the cold. We don't want you out there, okay? Stay with us as well. Great, so I'm gonna invite my Teen Science Cafe team to come up here and start the presentation, and we will move from there. Thank you for joining us. Sorry, one moment. How is everyone doing today? By show of hands, um, have any of you guys visited the Aquarium of the Pacific before? Okay. Um, so for those who are in our live audience, welcome. Um, my name is Jana, and I'm part of the Teen Science Cafe. And my team is over here if they would like to raise their hands. Okay, great. So I would like to tell you a little bit more about what the Teen Science Cafe is. Well, we are teams who are positively trying to influence um, other members in our community and to teach them more about marine animals. And so we work with scientists around the world who can come in to talk about their research while we also talk about conservation efforts and kind of how we as humans can help them. So for our audience who hasn't been here before or hasn't been here before, we had two past lectures in our overall our series of you seen, and it's about Antarctic um, researchers, um, women in STEM, who research in Antarctica and are telling their stories about what they researched and how their experiences were. So we had Dr. Amy Moran come to talk about picnic gonads, and they are like sea spiders. And we had dog, um, Dr. Margaret Amsler talk about benthic organisms, which are um, organisms that are on the deep sea floor. So we're going to have a turn and talk and you should turn to a neighbor or, you know, to a family member if you're at home. And we're going to start off with a couple of questions. So number one, um, what do you already know about seals? So please turn to someone next to you and start talking. Go. Okay, so let's kind of bring it in. Um, could anyone raise their hand to talk to me what you talked about with your partner? I'll choose out of the crowd if you don't raise your hand. Okay. Uh, well, I just 
Yeah, so um, my friend over here said that um, some of the seals are considered chunky, but they do have um, the reason why, yes, it's because of their blubber, and it's to insulate them so they are warm in the cold water that they're found in, yes. Anyone else? Yes. Oh wow. Yeah, so we're t we're talking about um my friend over here was talking about how um a lot of seals um when they do have uh pups, they do um they don't like interact with their pups for a long time because um uh, most pups become independent quick to help yeah, to hunt for themselves. Okay. So we'll move on to our next question. Um uh, when was the last time you saw a seal in real life? Go. Okay, let's kind of bring it in. Um, so, um, would anyone like to share kind of where they were at when they saw this seal? No one? Oh, in the back. Morro Bay? Oh, wow, yes. Uh, Morro Bay has a high population of seals, and you can kind of see them on the docks, they're hanging out. Um, anyone? Vanessa? Oh yes, we do have seals at the aquarium. Um, quick plug, if you guys want to come to the aquarium to see the seals, we have fantastic seals. Come to the aquarium. Okay, um, <laughs> so we're gonna have our third question. Um, what would you like to learn about seals? Okay, go. Okay, let's kind of bring it in for one more moment. Um, so, does anyone want to, you know, say what the, what question they had? Oh, yes. Okay, that's a great question. So, my friend here is talking about how some seals are more social than others, and we will talk about that in our presentation. So, hold on to that question. Anyone else? Yes. How often do they shed their whiskers? How often do they shed their whiskers? Okay, that's a great question. So we'll we'll probably learn something more about that. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna pass it on to my friend Vanessa, who will talk about more of what seals are and what pinnipeds are. Thank you. So we're going to start off the presentation by breaking down the word pinniped. Scientific language can be intimidating at first, but once you break it down, you'll find that most scientific words are very literal. And pinniped is no exception. Pinna comes from the Latin word for flipper or fin, while pedis comes from the Latin word for feet. So put together, pinniped quite simply translates to fin or flipper footed. This is because all pinnipeds have both a set of front flippers and a set of tail flippers that resemble a tail. They also have sensory hairs on their face called whiskers, which aid them in detecting their surroundings. And they have dark round eyes, which aid them in picking up light and seeing in murky waters. 
Pinnipeds all share these traits because they have adapted to a life of eating and moving and functioning both in land and in the ocean. So keeping these traits in mind, we're going to look at several different animal species, and we're going to try and identify which ones are the pinnipeds and which ones are not the pinnipeds. So if we look at the reticulated giraffe, is it a pinniped species? No, it is not. It does not have any fins or flippers. Let's move on to the California state fish. Is the Garibaldi a pinniped? Nope. Without whiskers or dark eyes, they are not a pinniped species. But wait, if we remember our traits and then look at the walrus, are they a pinniped species? Yes, they are. Aw. <laughs> what else you are such cuties? Are they pinnipeds? Yes, they are, and that's good. So now we all know at least one new thing about whale seals, and that's great because they're the topic of today's presentation. We're gonna learn all about whale seals, what they are, what they eat, where they live, and how we can help these magnificent creatures. I'm gonna pass it back to Jay. So, thank you, Vanessa. So, you know, we're talking about Weddell seals today. So, what do they eat? What is their diet? I know I'm hungry. I just had Taco Bell and I came here. Um, but they eat something that's way different than what us humans eat. And so, they actually eat a variety of food. So, they eat from cod to silverfish, not the insect, the fish. And they also eat squid, octopus, and prawns. And you can kind of see that's a wide variety of marine animals. Um, Weddell seals have great underwater vision um, for hunting so they can um, kind of find their food using their whiskers. Their whiskers are super sensitive so when there's water movement they can tell it was like oh there's a prey right there let me go get that right um, and they can actually dive 2,000 feet underwater for up to 45 minutes. No, I can't do that. But um, what they actually do is they exhale before they dive, and that basically takes the oxygens out of the air because if you think about a balloon and if you put it on water, it's going to stay buoyant. And the, because the seal, the seal has a lot of food that they want to eat, they have to dive deeper, so that's why they do this. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to Amina, who will be talking more about the anatomy of the seal. Okay. Hi. So, has anybody ever heard the term uh, vibrissae? No. Okay. So, vibrissae is pretty much just uh, okay. One person. It's, <laughs> it's pretty much a fancy word for whiskers. So, as Jay said, the whiskers are very sensitive, and it, it allows them to sense vibrations from fish, and it helps them catch their food. So, that's one of their senses. Um, another one of their uh, senses is photoreceptor cells. Photoreceptor cells—they're in their eyes, and these ones, they're pretty special. They help the seal hone in on light, especially in dark waters. So it allows them to actually see better in the water than they do on land. That's also something else that helps them find the fish. Okay. Um, flippers. The seals have, I suppose you could think of it as like an airplane. The hind flippers will help the seal um, propel themselves forward in the water, similar to an engine or a jet on an airplane. And the side flippers actually help them steer in the water so they don't go off track. Um, let's see. So blubber, as they also mentioned earlier, is a layer of fat. It's grown, the seal grows it with the nutrients they take from their food, from the fish and the um, other uh, meat they eat. It also insulates them pretty well and it keeps them really warm, especially in really cold temperatures where they live. Um, also, if anybody's ever seen a seal up close, many of us have, um, you'll see that they don't have any ears. That's actually not true. They do have ears. They just don't have any exter external ears, which actually helps them from keeping the water, the cold water, out of their ears so it doesn't get them, de um, get them infected. So I'm going to pass it on to Jay again, so who will uh, tell you more about the reproductive cycle of the what else seal. Okay, never mind. Passing on to Tatum. Hi, thank you so much, Amina. Um, I'm Tatum, and yes, I will be talking about a Weddell seal's reproductive cycle. So there, it can be summed up in about three stages. The first stage being the estral period. This is a state of estrus, which is also known as heat, for the female, meaning she's ready to mate and have copulation, which happens underwater. Copulation is 
sexual intercourse. And then the second stage would be gestation. This is the actual pregnancy period. This is within 11 months. And with a two, delay, two month delay in plantation. This is because during her pregnancy, when she first gets pregnant, after, immediately after reproduction, um, it lasts for, um, she goes into a process called diapause, which is where the sperm meets hers and it is not a fully formed embryo. And this forms a blastocyst. And basically, the not fully formed embryo stays there until the female feels safe and ready to continue her pregnancy. That's why it lasts longer than usual. And then, an average newborn is five feet long and 64 pounds. So, a little shorter than me, I'm 5'2". <laughs> and then, the last stage, the nursing duration. This is the time between five to six weeks where the mother stays with her pup and basically within a week, the pup knows how to swim, to haul in and out of the water, and by the end of the six week period, it can hunt and fend for itself. And then the female leaves and is ready to get pregnant again and do the whole cycle again. Thank you so much. Location and stability. Okay, so weddell seals do live around the Antarctica area. They generally live in the Southern Ocean along the islands, or the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. So somebody did say earlier, I'm not quite sure who, they said certain seals are more sociable with, d with um, different seals and some are very aggressive. So weddell seals are actually friendly with humans since they don't quite see them as a uh, pr uh, threat to their grounds. They're very aggressive towards other seals of their kind unless um, unless the until the during the breeding time since they have to protect their territory and yes they do rarely group up unless they are nursing their pups also um but handing this back to vanessa thank you unlike some of the seals were very sociable. We won't bite. Um, so we're going to have our last turn and talk. And so we'll have um, the first question. And that is, what did you learn? Is there something else that you learned that you didn't really know about seals or Weddell seals in general? OK, go. Okay, so can I get a consensus of kind of what we learned? Anyone raise their hand? Okay, yes. Oh, <laughs> well, you weren't planning, but this is actually really useful because um, Weddell seals, you know, every animal and plant go through a life cycle, and their life cycle is kind of different than what we would expect. So, you know, glad that you learned that. Um, anyone else? Yes. Yes, that's that's also really interesting. My friend here was talking about how um, when the seals will actually um, develop a fully um, sustainable embryo when they do feel safe, and that's really important because um, when there isn't much nutrients or like food and diet when I when I was talking about their diet is available they do not want to have their pup 
um, during that time so they can actually wait. Yeah, very cool. So we'll have our second question. Um, what questions do you have about the presentation? So it could have been from, you know, from the presentation you were watching, you're like, ooh, that's a good question. They didn't really talk about that. Um, does anyone have that? Okay, go. Hello, if you're coming in, if you would like to move to the front, if you would like to, um, we, we don't bite, I promise. Okay. All right, we're gonna wrap it up and start taking questions. So what are we wondering? What are we hoping to learn? Yes? What is the lifespan of a Weddell seal? That's very interesting. Any other questions we're wondering about? Anything we wanna know? Yes? Understand more about the habitat, that's good. We're gonna get into that later. Any other questions? Yes? How long can they postpone their pregnancy? That's a wonderful question. We're gonna get into that a little later. Anything else we're wondering? Nope, okay. Thank you so much. We're going to pass it on to Callum, who will introduce our special speaker. Thank you so much to our Teen Science Cafe team. They've done a great job putting together this presentation and practicing. We're going to shift gears into talking to our scientist, who has come a pretty long way, all the way from California. <laughs> Just kidding, but really up north. Antarctica, right? She has done amazing research in Antarctica, and it's just been so interesting um, week from week working and listening to the things that she's had to say, and especially the advice she has to give to young folks who are aspiring to maybe go to Antarctica or, or things like that. It's important to hear um, not just about her research, but a little bit more about her and her life. And um, so it's been a great experience working with her. So I want to bring up Dr. Beltran. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, well, I think uh, the teens took care of everything we needed to learn today. So, <laughs> no, thank you all for being here. It, it really is an honor and a pleasure. Um, I was able to spend 300 days in Antarctica as part of my dissertation work when I was becoming a doctor. And it was one of the most life-changing things I've ever done. And so to be able to share that with people um, is really special and I'm really r grateful for the opportunity to be here. So today I'm going to tell you uh, what Weddell seals or Weddell seals, depending on how you want to say it. I used to say Weddell seals, but then a kid came up to me once and said, do you study the big seals too or just the Weddell seals? And I was like, oh no. So Weddell seals is what I usually go with. Pick, pick your poison though. Um, what they taught me about the bottom of the world and, and how you can protect it. So I want to start with asking you to imagine something. You're in Antarctica, it's the end of a field day. There's a snowstorm, it comes in quickly. You have your emergency bag, you have the helicopter to sit in, that's all you have. You're hunkering down with your teammates, you have your Snickers bar, it's in the inside pocket because that's where it's warm right against your body so it doesn't freeze before it gets into your mouth. And you're waiting, you're waiting for the storm to pass. What does it feel like? Why are you in the Antarctic? Why are you dealing with these crazy conditions? And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll see why it's worth it for us to go all the way to the bottom of the world and to deal with crazy conditions like these to be able to do the science that we're lucky enough to be able to do. I will say to start that I have had the great privilege of working with a lot of women in the Antarctic. I'm not the only one. This was our, our team, one of the first times that I went down to the ice. You can see the plane behind us, the military plane is what took us down um, to the ice from New Zealand. 
This is our little five person team. You can see me in the black. That's my advisor in the middle of the picture, Jen Burns. She was the one who really trusted me and brought me down there for the first time. And then the other three are some of the best friends that I was able to make in graduate school. And you can see what we're wearing. This is uh, really a lot of uh, insulation. You'll learn a little bit more about insulation and why uh, feathers aren't the best insulation, but it'll do. We have these down coats, we have these rubber boots, we have these wind pants. It's about 12 pounds of gear that you're wearing all the time out there. So you can imagine Imagine walking around with this heavy gear just trying to stay warm. We take a lot of time to get down to the ice. So to give you an idea, I was in Alaska for my graduate work. So we would fly, fly from Alaska to California, then to Australia, then to New Zealand, and then to the Antarctic. It takes about three days. And you can see this is Antarctica here. That red dot is Ross Island where we went. And um, this is what the station actually looks like. So this is McMurdo Station. There's about 40 buildings. Usually during the peak season, there's about 800 people there, of which only about 100 are scientists. The rest are support staff, people that fly the helicopters, that cook the food, that clean everything, the janitors. It's a, a really wild community of people. And you can see that this entire town contains everything we need to live and do all of our science. So this blue building here is the cafeteria. This here is the science building. These are the dorm rooms over here. This is the water supply. This is where the snow machines are parked and we snow machine out onto the sea ice in order to see the seals. This is what it looks like on a good day. This is what it looks like on a less good day. Let's see if they'll play the video for me. I'll stop playing, I promise. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So this is what it looks like on a, on a not so good day. This is the kind of day where we would sit in the science building and catch up on some emails. But you can see these snowstorms just come in really, really quickly and it's cold, white out from the wind, and really dark in the middle of the day. Awkward selfie, hello. <laughs> So why, why would we do this? Why would we go down to the ice? Why would we travel so far away from our families in order to do this science? The answer is that nowhere on earth is there more seasonality in the environments and the habitats where these animals live. So you wanted to know more about the habitats. Seasonality is the single biggest component of what makes Antarctica special. So during the summer, there is warm temperatures, warm being a relative term, like 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're wearing just two jackets. Um, it's sunny all the time. Literally, the sun does not set for about two and a half, three months straight. Um, there's a ton of resources available to things like seals. So there's phytoplankton in the water column that makes for uh, really good productivity in fish. And there's different numbers of predators across the seasons too. And so that's in sharp contrast to the winter, for example, where it's impossibly cold, where it's dark for several months at a time, the sun never rises for three months straight, and where resources are almost absent. So this comparison makes for a really interesting sort of natural experiment to see how predators like seals can change what they do in order to survive in such extreme conditions. This is the difference between the Antarctic winter on the left and the Antarctic summer on the right. You can see that during the winter, the entire ocean is literally covered in ice. And so not many species live at the bottom of the world, um, but that brings us to Weddell seals, um, which are the most Southern living mammal. And the reason that we were so interested in studying these species across uh, the seasonality period is that tropical uh, places look something like this, where if we think about food resources across time, it's kind of moderate food resource. Uh, there's no pulses, it's just kind of stagnant and it's kind of mediocre. If we look at polar regions, we see this giant peak in food resources during summer, and the Weddell seals are supposed to take advantage of that, but no one's really been able to study what their behavior is, what their foraging success is, et cetera, across these different seasons. And so that's what we wanted to do. Weddell seals are able to live so far south because they have some of the strongest teeth of all mammals, and they can actually chew away the ice in order to make these breathing holes. So like the teens did a great job of introducing, these seals have to dive deep, right? They have to exhale, go down, stay down there for you know maybe 45 minutes, and then come back up, and they need access to air. These are mammals. They have to breathe air in order to survive. But it's so cold in the Antarctic that these breathing holes can freeze over really, really quickly. And so they can take their teeth and literally scrape away the ice, and that's what allows them to live so far south. They can literally make holes in the ice in order to survive. I want to show you a little bit about what they look like, because we're going to talk about blubber a lot during this presentation. And let me tell you, these guys are chunky. That was a very good description. 
And it's what allows them to survive. These seals can be 40% fat. Um, humans are, I don't know, somewhere between five and 10% fat. So they literally have like four to eight times more fat than us. And you can see that fat. They don't have necks. Most species, when you try to figure out their behavior, you put tags on them, you put collars on them around their necks. Weddell seals have no necks. So where do we put the tags? Any ideas? Where do you guys think we put the tags? Yeah. Yes, on their flippers. How did you know that? Did you see my presentation already? <laughs> that was a really good guess. Yeah, we put it on their flippers. Weddell seals also make incredible noises. Listen really closely. the rest of that video, but we can hear it and that's what matters. So these guys literally learn to make that sound under the ice because like the teens told you, um, these seals basically uh, breed underwater. And so they have to be able to make those noises in order to find mates underwater. That's how the males uh, demonstrate their breeding success. This is gonna be a really boring presentation if there's no slides. <laughs> can you put them back? Hello? He's panicking back there. <laughs> um, I'll answer one of the questions that was asked maybe. So you were asking about the, the whole embryonic diapause thing, which is totally crazy, right? Can you imagine like pausing pregnancy for two months? Um, the, the short answer to your question is that they can't pause it for a super long time. And the reason for that is because if they pause it for too long, then they miss this whole summer season of opportunity. And so what we typically see is that they pause it for about two months. Um, and if they need to pause it for longer than that, then they just don't have a pup. We call that skip breeding. It means that they literally don't breed that year, but usually they breed the year after that, which is great. Yeah. Um, if they don't, uh, if it doesn't like implant, it's basically just lost. Yeah. We use the word choice very loosely when it comes to physiology. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a natural reaction. Um, yeah, so it's a very natural process. And we, you know, it's, we don't know a lot about it, and that's a very uh, common, I would say, scientific question right now, is like how exactly, in climate change specifically, you know, are we going to see differences in the amount of uh, seals that are able to successfully produce pups? And the working hypothesis is that as long as seals are able to be fat enough, and to be healthy enough, then they'll be able to keep those pups, but we don't know what those thresholds are right now. And so there's a lot of people interested in trying to figure out exactly how stressed or sick a seal has to be in order to not implant um, that blastocyst. But it's a super good question, yeah. Yeah, are there any other questions? Yeah. Yes, that's a really good question. So the question was, can they produce multiple pups at a time? And the answer is, we've seen one a uh, set of twins ever. And that's like a very, very, very rare. Um, but they do produce one pup at a time. And it's usually about two out of every three years that they produce a pup. So um, does anyone want to guess the, the lifespan? Like how long the oldest Weddell seal has lived to be? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Eighty-seven. That would be amazing. I think the oldest seal is about forty, so that's still really old. But that's it could be older than that. That's just the oldest we've seen in animals that have been tagged, so we know exactly how old they are. I'm trying to think of a of a species that would be more like eighty. That would probably be like one of the small whale species or something like that. But yeah, it was a female. She produced a lot of pups. Yeah. So I'll get to this later, maybe. <laughs> um, but um, I wrote a children's book with my husband called A Seal Named Patches. And the seal that we chose to use in the book is, is this seal. She didn't actually have a name, but we named her Patches. But she lived to be 32, and she produced 19 pups over her lifetime. And she had so many pups that she's had something like 17 uh, like offspring that are associated with her because her pups grew up to produce pups of their own. So that's what we call a super mom. And one of our like research questions right now in elephant seals where I'm currently working is to figure out 
what exactly makes a super mom? Is it that they're really good at feeding? Is it that they're really good at avoiding predators? What exactly is it that makes them live so long and produce so many pups? Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, how long can a Weddell seal stand or water? You're testing my knowledge here. I think the longest dive is 98 minutes. So basically, you guys have been sitting here for like 50 minutes, so like double that. <laughs> yeah. I can hold my breath for like a minute and 20 seconds when I try really hard. So Weddell seals definitely have a, have a, lot, a lot more physiological adaptations than me. Yeah. Do you guys know anything about a marine mammal diving physiology? Can anyone mm -hmm. tell me like why pinnipeds can hold their breath for so long? Any ideas? We can guess. Yeah. Yeah, they have to dive deeper for food, yes. So what exactly do they do in order to stay underwater for so long? They exhale, you guys taught us that, right? What else? So if, they, if they're not using air in their lungs, then where are they getting the oxygen from to dive? You have an idea? Hey! Yes, yeah, so they're usually neutrally buoyant, thank you very much. Um, which means that they don't have to use very much effort in order to stay a lo long time underwater. Yeah, that's a really good guess. Um, I think we'll continue on. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I think we skipped like seven slides, but you know what? We're just going to roll with it. Um, so why do we study Weddell seals? Part of it is that they're super cool. They live a long time. Their pregnancy is amazing. They have all these cool adaptations. There's a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons that I was interested in studying Weddell seals is that we know individual animals because we attach tags to their flippers. You can see those blue tags on the right. Those have individual alphanumeric codes on them, so we know who each seal is. So when I walk up to a Weddell seal like that and I see its flipper, I can read the number and know exactly what seal that is. And that means that scientists can see the same seals over and over and be able to record information about the seals year after year which is really special. So we've learned a lot about uh, the annual cycle, um, about the pup birthing period, the nursing period, the breeding season, how they feed during the summer, how they replace their fur during the molt, and they also replace their whiskers during that time. And then about their pregnancy, how that starts in March, and then of course loops around to October. One thing I wanna point out is that, remember Antarctica is at the bottom of the world, southern hemisphere. That means the seasons are opposite from here, right? So our summer is in June, in the Antarctic, summer is in December. Does that make sense? It's totally opposite. So I tried to put the sun wherever it's the summer because it's very confusing for us Northern Hemisphere folks, but um, just so you guys know, all of these things are happening in summer, when it's warm, when there's light, and there's lots of resources supposedly available in the water column. So I'm gonna skip through the annual cycle because you've learned a lot about that already today and we're a little short on time and I'll get to some of the research questions, which are number one, how does seal diving behavior change across those seasons if the conditions are so different? Number two, how are these events um, affected by ice dynamics? And number three, what can we learn about other species by studying Weddell seals? And so before I dive into the research, I wanna show you a little video of a day in the life. This is two minutes of what it's like to be a researcher in the Antarctic. So here's me, I'm packing up that emergency bag I was telling you about that we put in the helicopter that has food and warm stuff and water and um, all of the scientific equipment that we need. Um, I'm just getting ready for the day here. This is the hallway of the science building. So I'm grabbing my big red coat. The shuttle comes, there are shuttle driving jobs in the Antarctic. They come right up to the door to the loading dock at the science building and we load up all of our gear into the back of, um, of the van and then they drive us down to where snow machines are parked and we load all the gear onto the snow machines. So all of this gear that you're seeing, we need in order to handle the Weddell seals. So what we do is we scan using that VHF scanner to see which seals are on the, on the beach, on the ice. Um, and then when we find a seal that we really want to handle, then we go down to the ice, we take all the gear to the snow machines, and then we tie it all up like this so that we can snow machine the gear out to wherever the seals are. Sometimes it's a 10 minute snow machine ride, sometimes it's an hour snow machine ride, depends on the day. This is what snow machining looks like, it's super fun, 10 out of 10 recommend. And it's not that fast, I sped it up for emphasis. <laughs> um, any ideas what we're doing here? Yeah, we're checking the ice to make sure it's not a crack so we don't fall in and get ourselves in big trouble. Then we find the seal, make sure it's the seal we're after, we're trying to look for. And then again, I'm always holding that pole so I can poke whatever cracks I think I see to make sure I'm not gonna fall in. Sometimes the snow will cover the ice cracks and it can be a little bit dangerous. It's important to have fun. 
No idea what I'm doing. I'm eating lunch, I guess. That's Mount Erebus. It's the most southern volcano in the world. We also take naps sometimes. It's very hard work. <laughs> and this is a helicopter picking us up. So sometimes when we have to go places that aren't snow machinable, if there's a crack in the ice or if it's too far, then the helicopter comes and picks us up. Helicopter pilots um, are a special kind of people, and they like to challenge themselves. Like, how close can I get to the researchers to land, which we don't love, but they are very good at their jobs, thankfully. So we'll load up the helicopter with our gear, same thing as the snow machine, and the helicopter takes us home, which is really fun. You get these little headsets, you get to talk to people. It's, it's a good time. It's always so warm in the snow machine. They always had chocolate and sometimes pizza. So it was a real treat at the end of the day. That's our safety guy. Um, this is the lab building. So this looks pretty similar to the lab buildings at our university, actually. Um, and you can see all our gear like drying out, all our, our coolers where we keep everything warm. You can see the scientific posters on the walls. Um, we're going to go into the loading dock here and out the door to the outside, which is literally a freezer door. <laughs> and then I think we're going to run over to the dining hall, which is that blue building. You can see how windy it is if you look at my hair. This is kind of one of those days where like you can get away with just having a pair of jeans and a, like a puffy jacket on, but like after 20 seconds you're kind of miserable, so you start running. Um, this is inside the main building, so some, some people live in here. Um, this is the galley here. Even before the pandemic, we were really scared of getting any sort of like germs or like viruses on station, so you wash your hands before and after every meal. Um, we're going to go up here and you're going to get to see what the actual meal station looks like. So you get a tray and you get to see what's there for the day. This particular day there were bananas, which there never are, um, and I was really, really excited about that because there's not a lot of fresh produce on station. Um, I actually think we had avocados this day too. It was a really good day. But hopefully that gives you a sense for like what it's like here. We literally eat all of our meals at this galley and the whole, the whole community does as well. So it's a really special place to be able to kind of socialize and interact with people and yeah, cucumbers. Woo! This is not representative of typical Antarctic food. Usually it's like rehydrated milk and uh, microwaved green beans, but this is a good day. So that's a day in the life. And so hopefully that gives you a sense for sort of what it is that we do out there. And then I want to get into the research and sort of like why it is that we're handling the seals and trying to learn about them. So some of the, some of the work that we do is observational. We walk around, we observe the seals, we write some information about them. Other times we actually sedate the seals and do medical procedures on them. Very, you know, bare minimum medical procedures. We'll take a little bit of blood, we'll do some measurements to figure out how big they are, and we'll usually put an instrument or two on their flippers in order to measure their behavior. It takes about 30 minutes. The seal is totally safe and happy the whole time. They don't even know what happened to them. It's just like if you get like a tooth pulled or something like that and you go under general anesthesia. But we do that out on the ice, which is very challenging for a lot of reasons. I can answer questions about that if you have them. One of the most important things for us to do is weigh the seals. These seals are 500 kilograms, about 1,200 pounds, and so we can't just put them on a normal scale like you and I would step on. They would just crush the scale. So what we do instead is we carefully, once they're sedated, roll them into this red sling and then hoist them up into the air from the tripod with a scale hanging from the top. And once they're suspended in midair, then we know how much they weigh. We weigh them before and after their foraging trips, and that gives us really useful information about how successfully they've fed. And we can translate that, of course, into how healthy the ocean is. And that's really important for a lot of reasons, like predicting how climate change will impact the fish stocks that are in the Antarctic. We also do some sort of less invasive measurements, like um, creating these three-dimensional models by taking pictures. So if you take a camera and you walk around the seal, you can put all of that into an architecture software package and be able to produce these three-dimensional models and therefore measure the volume, how uh, much seal is in the seal, <laughs> and also the surface area. So um, basically, for example, the surface in which heat could be lost from the animal. We also take measurements on the animal itself. So um, we'll figure out how long the animal is at all these various locations on the body. And at those same measurements, we actually figure out how much blubber the seals have. I'm not going to get too much into blubber because I suspect you'll learn a little bit more about it later. But like I hinted at before, these animals have a lot of blubber, sometimes up to two or three inches of blubber at a single part of the body. And what we can do is take an ultrasound, just like one that would be used to diagnose pregnancy in humans, and put it on the seal's body in order to measure the depth of the blubber layer at every single location on the body. So we can figure out exactly how much blubber they have, which is pretty cool. We also attach instruments to them. So yes, they're attached to the flipper. Ding, ding, ding. You can see two tags in this photo. This first one is a little blue battery. That's what's called a time depth recorder. So it records the depth that the seal is at 
at every single four second period for the entire foraging trip. That allows us to look at their actual diving patterns. The second tag, this one here, is called a very high frequency or VHF tag. And those are the tags that um, are heard by that antenna that I was swinging around in the video. So that lets us know where the seals are. We can literally triangulate that signal from within the helicopter. So I would help fly the helicopter around and basically listen for the seals and go where the signal was strongest in order to find individual seals on like 80 miles of sea ice. So we have those instruments on the seals so we can measure behavior. We also were able to uh, quantify exactly how many fish they ate because we put a logger on their lower jaws. Raise your hand if you've heard of a Fitbit. Yeah, you guys remember those things? So those are basically accelerometers. So every time you walk, one, two, three, you have this, this signal in the acceleration um, data that signifies what a step is. And that's how Fitbit got popular. They decided 10,000 steps was a really good thing for the day. So our question was, well, how many eating instances does the seal have to have in order to make its living for the day? So we would glue these small accelerometers to the jaw of the seals when they were under sedation in order to measure how many jaw motion events or basically how many fish the seals ate. And so here's what those data actually look like. Don't panic, I'll walk you through it. So on the x-axis here is time. So you can see this is a dive that lasted around 10 minutes. This is the depth record here. So this is uh, zero meters of the surface of the ocean down to 300 meters. So the seal starts at the ocean surface and dives down, then chases fish up and down in the water column eating and then comes back up to the surface. On that same time period, this is the acceleration. So this here, this, whoosh, this big like surge, this big spike, that's a prey capture event. So that's when the seal is opening and closing its mouth really quickly. And so we can calculate those and um, overlay those onto the dive record here. So we can figure out exactly where in the water column the seals are eating. The reason that works is because this is what the seals are eating. This is from a video camera glued to a seal's head at about 900 feet under the ocean surface. So you see those little things that are flying into the seal's mouth? Those are tiny little fish. They're called silverfish. And so every single time the seal opens its mouth, it's eating one fish. So it's a really good metric for us to tell how much fish the seals are eating. So I'm going to tell you what we learned from these seals um, in terms of their diving behavior. So I told you we wanted to calculate some metrics like mass gain, how much they fed um, across these different seasons. And I'll show you what we found. I'm just going to put those over there to get them out of the way. So seals basically did two types of dives. The first dive type was called a pelagic dive. That means the seal is diving in open water. Um, those were usually, they kind of look like this. Um, so they have these kind of wiggles at the bottom. We call them wiggles. They're actual like vertical excursions is a scientific term, but basically just means they're chasing fish up and down in the water. Um, and that was very different than what we call benthic dives or seafloor dives, um, where you can clearly see that the seal is diving all the way down super deep to the seafloor and then feeding along the seafloor. So if you guys saw the sea spiders talk, you know there's a lot of stuff on the bottom of the sea in the Antarctic, and the Weddell seals are basically just slurping all of that up. I don't know if they eat sea spiders. They've probably done it, but they're looking for like benthic fishes that kind of sit on the bottom, which is pretty cool. Um, so we can compare across these dive types how much mass the seals gained in terms of the amount of kilograms per day. So a kilogram is how many pounds, guys? I always forget, 2.2? I think it's 2.2 pounds. So one kilogram is about two and a half pounds per day. Um, and so you can see that the seals were eating a lot more and gaining a lot more mass during the summer than they were during the winter, which makes sense, right? We talked about how there's probably more nutrients, more resources, more food available in the summer than the winter. So we saw that reflected in the data. We also saw that their energy gain was a lot higher in the summer as compared to the winter. So that answered a really big question for us. Now, we got super lucky, and we put a dive recorder on an animal in 2013 in November, and we didn't get it back because the seal didn't come back for 15 months. 15 months. So this is the longest dive record for a pinniped that has ever been recorded. And I haven't published this yet, so you guys are seeing, like, fresh off the press. It's a little old now, but really, really cool, unique data. What you can see is there, there's a huge seasonal difference in how the seal is diving. You can see during the summer, the dives are pretty shallow. I mean, they're still 400 meters, like 1,200 feet underwater. It's not really shallow, but compared to winter it is. Here's the winter. The seal's diving to 2,400 feet underwater. This is incredible. It's like a 240-story building that the seals are diving to. And these are, you know, regular dives. And then you can see in the second summer that we recorded here that the dives are shallow again. So the question about seal habitat was a really good one. And the answer is that 
the habitat changes seasonally, and that has a huge impact on the mass gain that the seals have throughout the year. That, of course, has a lot to do with the amount of sunlight that's in the water column, right? And I talked about that a little bit. And so I want to point out just one really cool pattern that I found in these data that I published that was one of the big papers to come out of my dissertation work. And it was this sort of deep, shallow, deep diving that you can kind of see here during the summers. This happened every summer across every seal. So if I just pull out that summer period for one seal and plot depth across time, you can see that deep, shallow, deep pattern. That's one seal, here's a second, here's a third, here's a fourth. I would show you 90 of them, but they're literally all the same. We've never seen this before. We're like, what is this? And what we figured out is that there's a phytoplankton bloom that happens in the middle of summer, and it's right when the ice breaks out. So you remember I showed you in winter there's ice everywhere, and then in summer there's no ice? At some point that ice has to melt and break out and go away. And when that happens, all of a sudden, the top surface of the ocean water sees light for the first time in months. And that sparks this huge phytoplankton bloom. And the phytoplankton bloom attracts krill, which attracts fish, which attracts seals. And so what we see is that in the winter, all of that stuff, all of the food and all of the seals are diving really deep. And then during the summer period, that's all coming up really, really shallow. So we're seeing this sort of gradual transition in where the seals are feeding throughout the, um, throughout the year, which is a really cool discovery for us to make and has really important implications for other species too that I'll talk about in a second. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the types of dives that the seals were doing. So remember I said there were seafloor dives and open water dives. This is the percent of um, seafloor dives during the different seasons. So you can see during the summer, they're doing almost no seafloor dives. Most of their dives are in open water because they're much more shallow. And you can see here that during winter and fall and spring, um, there's a lot more seafloor dives, which is really important for the people that are studying the seafloor organisms to know where all the seafloor organisms going. Well, the seals are probably eating a lot of them because there's a lot of seals, and it turns out seals eat a lot in order to get their blubber stores nice and fat. I'm going to skip that for time. So what did I show you today? Well, for the science side of things, I showed you that summer is associated with really high mass gain, really high feeding effort and success, and these really shallow open water dives. And that's really different than what happens in the winter in this highly seasonal environment where there's lower mass gain, lower feeding effort and success, and deep benthic or seafloor dives. There's one more thing I want to point out, which is that these findings are important for Weddell seals, but even more important for other species. And I'll tell you what I mean. So this is an annual calendar. Here's that summer period, right? And I told you there's a big phytoplankton bloom. We know that there's lots of krill that come to the area and lots of fish that come to the area. That happens right when the Weddell seals wean from their mom. So this here is the offspring dependence period, basically the nursing period. So this is when Weddell seals are nursing their pups for about a month or two. And then this is the time when those pups become independent and are feeding for the first time. That is perfectly aligned with when there's lots of fish and lots of krill and lots of phytoplankton. And if we look at two other species, if we look at emperor penguins and if we look at minke whales, the offspring dependence period is a lot longer, but that transition to independence in the offspring happens at the exact same time. So what you're seeing is that this resource pulse is basically synchronizing the reproductive cycles across species because all species young benefit from there being a lot of food. Juveniles are the most sensitive of any of the age classes. And so if they can become independent for their moms at just the right time of year in this really seasonal system to find lots of food, evolution is gonna select for that over time. And we're seeing that in this ecosystem, which is a pretty cool thing to be able to find. I love that. Shallow prey during phytoplankton bloom, synchronizing its timing across species. That's what Weddell seals have taught us about the bottom of the world. So in this last little bit of time that I have, I just want to ask you to reflect back to when you were imagining you're a field biologist. It's the end of the day. The helicopter's coming to pick you up. You've done a lot of really important work, and you're really excited to get back to that dining hall and eat whatever it is that they have in those weird metal trays. What are you most excited about that you've learned or taken from the Antarctic? And I want you to take that with you today and teach it to someone else, because that's what this is all about. I also want to show you a little bit of some of the outreach that we were able to do as part of this Antarctic science experience. So I told you I wrote a book called The Seal Named Patches. It was actually after a stuffed seal that had patches on it. So I would visit classrooms in Alaska, and every class would get a patch, and they would sign their names. So this is Patches the Seal. She was, um, I sewed her. <laughs> she was sewn. Um, to match the exact size of the smallest Weddell seal we ever handled. So you can see she's pretty similar in size to this seal here that's under general anesthesia. There's me in my big coat. 
And we were able to take patches to visit lots of students. Patches is currently in Santa Cruz in my research lab, and my grad students take patches now to visit classrooms, which is pretty cool. And this is the book that we wrote. Um, you can get it on Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, et cetera, if you're interested. It's a pretty fun book and has lots of pictures I wasn't able to show today about what it's like to work in the Antarctic. It's uh, meant for second and third graders, but honestly, like, it's kind of fun for everyone. Um, and I want to leave you with some pieces of advice. This is advice that I wish I'd had when I was seven years old, saw an emperor penguin for the first time, and was like, that seems cool, but kind of crazy to even think about going there. So the first thing is to take care of yourself. I know that lots of teens, myself included, um, when I was younger and still now, are obsessed with doing all the things, right? You want to do everything right. You want to do well in school. You want to have lots of friends. You want to play sports. And that's super important, but it's also really important to take care of yourself. And that is probably never been more important than it is now with the pandemic and with politics being what it is and with wars and everything. It's really important to take a step back and take care of yourself because you can't take care of the people around you or do the things you want to do unless you've taken care of yourself first. Always pay yourself first. Piece of advice number one. Piece of advice number two is dream big. Step outside your comfort zone. If I had stayed in my comfort zone, I would have never gone to the Antarctic. I grew up in San Diego. I'd never even been to the snow when I went to the Antarctic for the first time. But I made myself do that because I knew it would be important for my career and for my development. So stepping outside of your comfort zone can be hard, but it's really important in terms of being able to dream big and meet, and meet those dreams. Third thing, make time to learn from the people around you. You will interact with so many people in the span of your life, and every single one of them knows something that you don't or knows how to do something that you don't. So take the time to learn from them. It will pay off, I promise. Um, and the last thing is spread your knowledge about our planet. You know, you have a really uh, special gift, and that's the gift of exploring and learning and sharing those things with people. And I think that's one of the best things we can share with anybody is, is the knowledge that we've gained. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be able to share this really special place with you, and I want to encourage you to share it with other people so that everyone can know how special this place is and that we need to protect it. Um, the last thing is I just want to thank all the incredible people. You know, working in the Antarctic is not... A solo adventure. <laughs> the research I was there on was a $1.4 million grant paid for by taxpayers um, that really was taken care of by hundreds of contractors in the Antarctic and a team of incredible women scientists. So I'm super grateful to all of those people for their support um, and to you all for being here and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you again, Dr. Veltrin. That was really interesting. Before we take some questions, um, I just wanted to say goodbye to our friends on the live stream. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. Come join us next time. We hope to see you again soon. We're going to answer some questions and hang back. Um, I certainly have a lot of questions. <laughs>